Bitcoin's properties make it the perfect asset to gain one's sovereignty. But this is not only true for individuals. This is as important a topic for nation states as it is for nation citizens. For some economies today, particularly the ones that have been victims for decades or centuries of some form of colonialism, Bitcoin could represent hope for a new uncontrolled industry that is also directly profitable at home. The case of the US expansion in Central America is an interesting one, because it is very different from the colonialism approach European nations had from the 15th century. For the US, it all started less than half a century after they gained their independence. In 1813, the Spanish-American Wars of Independence were underway. Following the French invasion of Spain in 1808, the Spanish Empire's weakness was the opportunity for Latin American countries to fight back and gain their independence. The United States observed from a distance, but with increasing interest. This also represented an opportunity for other European nations, particularly France and England, that could see the potential for their reach in the region to increase. The United States would not let that happen. Soon after gaining their independence, the Central American nations started looking at the US for protection from the nations of South America and Mexico. Mexico was more aggressive towards Central American nations because Spain had a strong influence there. From 1822, the US recognized these new nations as independent, and this triggered a series of events. Walter Lefebvre studied these events in his book Inevitable Revolutions, the United States in Central America. In 1823, the US issued the Monroe Doctrine, essentially telling the world, particularly European colonial states, to leave the Western Hemisphere alone. That same year, the Central American countries, following the example of the United States, created the Federal Republic of Central America, also called the United Provinces of Central America, where they unified to create one republic. Now, this unit, of course, didn't last long because of many conflicts of interest, opinions, influences, etc. As the years went by, tensions over territory were increasing between the US and Mexico, particularly over Texas and California. The US was trying to become a continental nation and reach the Pacific Ocean. The British Empire strongly supported Mexico. They were, after all, the first European power to recognize Mexico's sovereignty. And this relationship further increased the existing tensions. This tension eventually led the United States to make its first of many appearances in Central America during the Mexican-American War. The conclusion of the US Civil War ended slavery for the United States, and this required a shift in the approach the US had toward the rest of the world. They started a foreign investment approach. By the 1890s, the US was investing in banana, coffee plantations, railroads, gold and silver mines, and a few years later, even utilities and government securities. By the start of World War I, North Americans had already constructed the main production institutions on which Central American nations trade and even economic survival depended. Walter Lefebvre shows that between 1897 and 1908, American investments in Central America rose sharply from $21 million to $41 million. Instead of government securities that the British favored, more than 90% went into direct ventures like banana plantations and mining. A huge portion of the Central American economy was built and directed towards US exports only. And these numbers for each of these countries are crazy, like in Costa Rica. In 1929, Costa Rica exported $18 million worth of goods, $12 million of which were coffee and $5 million of which were bananas. United Fruit was undoubtedly the country's leading corporation, and American investment in Costa Rica had almost caught up to British investment. Railroads, mines, cables, and oil concessions were all under North American sovereignty. Nicaragua. Bananas and coffee accounted for $2 million and $6 million, respectively, of Nicaragua's $11 million in exports. United Fruit and Atlantic Fruit each claimed 300,000 acres in Nicaragua. The major mines, railroads, timber, industry, and financial institutions were owned by, or managed by, North Americans. El Salvador. 
Coffee and sugar together accounted for $17 million of El Salvador's $18 million in exports. El Salvador's most significant domestic financial institution was owned by San Francisco Interest. Its transportation infrastructure was reliant on North American capital, and New York banks handled its bonds instead of the British banks. Honduras. Bananas made up $21 million of Honduras' 25 million exports of goods. In Honduras, the train network, the ports, and almost all of the land used to grow bananas and rubber were all under the control of United Fruit and its affiliates. The thriving silver mine was owned by North Americans. Guatemala. $19 million of Guatemala's $25 million in exports were coffee, while $3 million was in bananas. In Guatemala, the US had complete control of all railroads except a few kilometers. They had one-fifth of the country's territory, the top bank, several significant enterprises, and the largest utility company. Central America as a whole would face devastation if the cost of coffee and bananas suddenly decreased in global markets. Since they had gained so much power in Central America, many American investors would also share in the catastrophe. Through America's big guns, the nation roars, on guard. On guard to the end that Uncle Sam's manpower in industry manpower in action shall continue to answer America's call to arms. This is what happened multiple times when the US was involved in other international conflicts, particularly World War I and World War II. The Central American industries were devastated, leaving millions in deep poverty because in times of war, the US no longer needed coffee and bananas. This pushed the local governments to put on more debt, borrowed from the US of course, and become even more dependent on the US, essentially enslaving them for the long term. Roosevelt declared in 1905 that the United States would henceforth act as the policeman to maintain order in the hemisphere. But that term allowed US presidents to intervene according to any criteria they were creative enough to devise. These reasons included ensuring investments, securing the canal, acting as a natural protector, and replacing the declining presence of the British. This opened the door for the US to take military in the region, with no other power to stop them. By that time, anyway, more serious problems were starting to brawl in Europe. August 1914. The leading nations of Europe prepared to go to war. To defend the resources the United States had captured in Central America through the corporate acquisition of nations, the US government had to increase its political influence in the region. This is how a century long of US military engagement, political involvement, manipulation, and the funding of gangs and militia started. Thinking they're not using the same kind of influence today would be an illusion and a mistake. Laura Jane Richardson is a general in the United States Army, who is the commander of the United States Southern Command. She recently said the following, talking about Latin America. This region is so rich in resources. It's off the charts rich. And they have a lot uh, to be proud of. And our competitors and adversaries also know how rich in the resources that this region is. 60% of the world's lithium is in the region. You have heavy crude. You have light sweet crude. You have rare earth elements. You have the Amazon, which is called the lungs of the world. You have the 31% of the world's fresh water here in this region. Uh, and there are adversaries that are taking advantage of this region every single day, right in our neighborhood. And I just look at what happens in this region in terms of security, uh, impacts our security, our national security, uh, in the homeland and in the United States. We need to strengthen our neighborhood and we need to realize how uh, resource rich this neighborhood is and how close our competitors and our adversaries are in the region. Max Kaiser pointed out the hypocrisy of these words in a recent Max and Stacy report, mentioning her words or lure to bring these countries closer and repeat what the US has done in the past, take control of their resources. 
Well, what about the CIA hit squad sent down to El Salvador in the 1980s? Well, what about the coups in Central America and Latin America for decades? Uh, you know, she keeps saying that we just want to be your friend. We're friendly. We're partners. Trust us. You know, we've always been your friend. We've always been here for you. And those, those are such egregious lies. Bitcoin is a property defense system that doesn't require brute physical force. If the resource-rich nations of Central and Latin America can be put to good use through Bitcoin mining, the countries of the region have the opportunity of building a strong, independent and modern industry that cannot be taken away from them and can secure their sovereignty. It can allow these countries to secure a new source of income at home, directly paid in a currency that can be transported instantly around the world to trade with any nation, beyond the limits of a single strong nation like the United States that will enslave them economically given the opportunity. El Salvador is trying to lead the way by opening up its natural resources to provide energy to Bitcoin miners. El Salvador has become the country to watch in the evolution of Bitcoin, first making it legal tender, now taking extraordinary steps to address mining's energy usage problem. CNBC.com tech reporting Mackenzie Segalos is here with more on what we know about their latest efforts, Mackenzie, involving volcanoes. <laughs> So for the first time, Kelly, El Salvador is officially using power harnessed from a volcano to mine for Bitcoin. President Bukele said a couple hours ago that the country has so far earned $269 worth of Bitcoin. Now, details are sparse, but here's what we do know. Earlier this week, the president posted a video showing these sweeping landscape aerials of an energy factory in the thick of a forest bordering a volcano. We saw a shipping container full of Bitcoin mining rigs, as well as technicians installing and plugging in ASIC miners. We also know the government is working hand in hand with state-owned geothermal electric company Lajeo, which is already running these power plants across the country. So they're not starting from zero when it comes to infrastructure. Kelly? It seems like they're trying to address the energy usage uh, that with the energy crunch happening globally right now uh, is one of the major things that critics often talk about when it comes to using Bitcoin, period, right? Right, it absolutely is. And if this works, it could be a huge plus for the larger debate around Bitcoin's carbon footprint. What we're talking about here is geothermal energy. It's renewable, it's clean, and in some places, it might be making use of a previously untapped resource, which makes the case that Bitcoin can act as an accelerant to renewable energy development. This gives a strong new industry to benefit from financially, but can also allow the country to produce a surplus of energy. In fact, it is happening already. Cell President Daniel Ivarez confirmed that the country exported 595,000 megawatt hours between January and July of this year, which is 390,000 megawatts more than the previous year's total of 204,000 megawatts. The purpose of this research is to really look at the importance of energy for economic growth. Of course, it's important the job creation element of energy is also important at the contribution, the direct contribution to the GDP, but it's also as well important the contribution that energy does through other sectors of the economy. One of the best ways to bring energy to people is through greater economic growth. If you don't have constant supplies of electricity in a country like India or others, you pay a real penalty in terms of, uh, in terms of economic growth. During our research, we discovered, as we expected, that energy is a very capital-intensive uh, industry. So it's not just the job creation, but how many other jobs are created in other parts of the economy. And we have seen multiplier up to four times. The case study we used was the development of shale gas, which has been very rapid in the United States, that in the last few years has created 600,000 new jobs. There are very few industries in the OECD countries that have created 600,000 new jobs. Energy should be seen as an enabler of job creation in the wider economic system. And as such, it's important that the cost of energy is as low as possible and with the lowest impact on environment as possible. If these two objectives are obtained, energy is playing its full role in society. The abundance of power is a proven way to bring prosperity to society. El Salvador, if left alone to develop in this direction, could become one of the fastest developing countries in the world. But the question is, will the US let that happen? Or will they make sure El Salvador keeps its current status? These stories and more are part of the research we are doing for our new documentary project, The Fight for the US Dollar. Join our project, donate and be part of the movement. Find out more in the description.